Hi there, so welcome to segment two of lecture one. And this is where we'll start to look at how to rotate uh, a stress matrix or a stress tensor. Um, uh, that is how to rotate the coordinate axes that uh, lead to the numbers we write down in the stress tensor that describe the state of stress, it's still the same state of stress, in a material. Um, so the way we do this is we think about our little elemental square that we were thinking about before. So this is a square that's of unit thickness, so we're just going to consider a 2D problem in effect. Um, and it's a little square with some state of stress on it. We've got some normal stresses, which we're calling sigma x and sigma y in the x and y directions. We've got a shear stress tor xy and tor yx, but they're the same as we said in the last segment, acting on faces. Um, and the little square is of infinitesimal lengths dx and dy, so it's got an area dx dy. Um, and what we do here is we consider what would happen if we make an imaginary cut. So if we make an imaginary cut in our block down at some angle, like that, and the sum angle we'll use um, will be an angle here of theta. And I'm going to swap to using a slightly better pen. Let's see if this goes any better. A bit. An angle there of theta. So we've defined an angle that's theta down, or theta up here, from this point. And if we make that cut, if this block is in static equilibrium, well, we've taken away this half, and this means this half would, would fly off over that way. So we're going to have to apply a new stress on this cut plane. And that new stress we'll call sigma. And we'll have a shear stress along the plane, uh, which we'll call tor. And if we have those stresses, then those stresses must be uh, big enough to stop this bit going flying off when we've removed the rest of the block. So imagine when we make the cut, what stresses would be required in order to keep it in equilibrium such that it doesn't fly away. Um, and we'll say that the cut plane has a length here, which is a length c that defines the length of the cut plane, so that length there. And then we can satisfy equilibrium to find what tor and sigma must be for some angle theta. And then uh, we can satisfy, having satisfied equilibrium, we could then say, well, okay, how, uh, how would that be if, if the cut plane was there? And that would be sort of uh, another 90 degrees around. Uh, and then we would have a new stress state, uh, that and those that for a new cube that was then a cube, something like that, say. So this is my original one, this is my one at 90 degrees. And I then have a new stress state in this new set of axes, uh, under x prime and y prime, instead of x and y that we started off with before. Um, and that would be uh, a new way of writing down the stress matrix. So we'd start off with one stress tensor or matrix. Um, and we'd rotate it to our primed coordinate system, and we'd have our sigma primed set stress tensor. Now, we're doing this in 2D, so we'd have left, if you like, the Z components alone when we did that. We'd just be rotating the 2 by 2 matrix, or tensor, in between. So we leave the Z components alone when we did that rotation. That would be a rotation about Z. So that's what we're going to do. So now all we've got to do is do the algebra. Um, so let's, let's do that. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to grab the notes to be slightly careful about how I do this. Now what I'm going to do is first I'm going to resolve stresses, forces parallel to sigma. So resolving force parallel to sigma. Then if we resolve forces, we've got, uh, going that way, we've got sigma times c times the thickness 1. And then we've got to consider the contribution from all of these guys. Um, and they are 
offset by, they have to be, be equal to all these guys that are pulling it that way. So I've got a sigma x, but I've got to resolve it down to the component in that direction. And that angle there, well, that's another theta. So the resolve component of that is sigma x times cos theta. And it's acting along this length. And this length here is also c times cos theta. And this one here is c times sine theta. So we've got a sigma x times cos theta uh, squared. We've got this sigma y resolved into a component that way. Um, and that's here, that's acting on an area sine theta. And this angle here, well, that angle there is theta. This is 90 degrees. So that's got to be 90 minus theta. So I've got plus sigma y times c sine theta. That's the length it's acting on to turn it into an area times 1. There's a 1 there as well. Um, times, then we've got cos 90 minus theta. But cos 90 minus theta is just sine theta. So we can just call it sine squared theta. Now we've got a tor xy, and we've got to resolve that tor xy. Let me just tidy this up again. We've got to resolve that tor xy into a component going that way. So we've got to know that angle. And that angle there, well, if that angle there, oops, that angle there was theta, uh, this is 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees, this is also theta. Um, so I've got a tor xy times cos theta times the length c sine theta. Okay, so we can get rid of that guys, those guys there. Now we've then got one last one to do. We've got this guy resolved down that way. And that's this angle here. That angle is theta. This is 90 degrees, so that's 90 minus theta. So I've got another tor xy times c cos theta, which is the length. And I've got times cos 90 minus theta, which is another sine theta. So actually, oops, once I put my c in, no, my c's there, I've got two of these guys. So I could rub that guy out again. So that's an equation for sigma. I can now cancel, oops, I've got a c here as well. I can now cancel through by c from all of these guys. And I just end up with my final equation that sigma is equal to sigma x cos squared theta plus sigma y sine squared theta plus 2 tor xy cos theta sine theta. Now, there's a bit of a game to do here, but first let's resolve in the other direction. So... We can also, uh, so let me just write that down. That's equation 6. That's equation 5 in the notes. We can also resolve forces perpendicular to sigma, that is parallel to tor, parallel to this shear stress here. And then we'll have tor times the area it's operating on, which is c times 1. And then we resolve all the forces going this way. And we end up with another set of equations. So if we come back, we've got to resolve sigma x now into the component that's going that way. And this angle's theta, this angle's 90 degrees, that angle's 90 minus theta. So we've got sigma x times c cos theta is the area it's operating on, times what's now cos of 90 minus theta, so sine theta. And now we've got, uh, and that's happening in the same direction as tor, but it's on the other side of the equal sign, so we've got a minus there. Then we've got, uh, so we need to rub all these guys out. c cos theta, that diagram's getting kind of messy, I'm trying to keep it fairly clean. 
Then I've got, uh, let's do this sigma y now. This sigma y, and I'm going to resolve it into this direction. And I've got a sigma y, and that's just cos theta there, because that angle there is just theta. So I've got a plus sigma y times c sine theta, that's the area it's operating on, times resolved into the right direction, which is cos theta. I've got to resolve my tor xy now. So let's resolve this tor xy into a component that's going that way, uh, or that way. So, and I want to know what this angle is. This angle was theta, so you can see that's 90, and I've got 180. So this guy here is 90 minus theta. So I've got a, a tor xy. The area is c sine theta. And I've got a cos of 90 minus theta, which is another sine theta. So I've got a sine squared. And it's actually it's operating the same direction as tor, but it's on the other side of the equal sign. So actually, I want a minus. And this last one here, this guy, he's operating in the same direction. Um, and he's happening uh, down in theta here. So it's just a cos theta. So I've got a plus tor xy. C cos theta, that's the area it's operating on, resolved in the direction by another cos theta, so it's cos squared. So here I've got, my C's are going to cancel again. Tor is equal to um, sigma y minus sigma x cos theta sine theta plus tor xy cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. And that's equation 7 and equation 8 in the notes. So that's our resolution of forces. We're, we're done here. We've got our solution. Now there are some things we can do to make what these plot out like a little bit more obvious. Uh, so let's do that before we uh, before we turn to what those look like, before we graph it out. So uh, I'm just going to tidy up the board a moment, and uh, then we'll be back in a second. So if I wipe all that out. Um. OK, so now I've just rewritten equations 6 and 8. Um, now, there's two things we can do here. First, notice the cos squared plus sine squared here. So if we take equation 6 and mess with it, we can say sigma is equal to sigma x plus sigma y times cos squared plus uh, sine squared theta. times a half, plus, here's the really low trick, a half sigma x minus sigma y times uh, cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. Let me just check that. So if I add those together, I've got a half cos squared theta sigma x here and another half there. So I've got a whole cos squared theta sigma x. And here I've got a sigma y 
sine squared theta times a half. And here I've got another sine squared theta sigma y times a half. So I've got a whole one of them, so it adds up, right? But this is equal to 1, and that's, of course, equal to cos 2 theta. So what I've got here, let me pull my half over, do a bit of magic whiteboard rubber. What I've got here is the average of the two normal stresses, a cos 2 theta times the difference between them. So I'll just rewrite that, a half sigma x minus sigma y times cos 2 theta. And that's the same as those two. So this is the average of the two normal stresses, and cos 2 theta times the difference between them. And notice that uh, cos, two, cos theta sine theta is equal times 2 is equal to sine 2 theta. So I've got tor xy sine 2 theta. And that is equation 9. And that's, in some ways, a simpler way to look at equation 6. It's the average of the two principal stresses, the difference between them times cos 2 theta, and tor xy times sine 2 theta. Now the other thing, let's we'll do the same trick to equation 8, we'll mess with it again. So this is like a half sine 2 theta. So we've got tor is equal to sigma y uh, let's put a minus sign through, so it goes sigma x minus sigma y, so we keep this symmetry here, times minus a half times sine 2 theta. Because sine 2 theta is equal to 2 cos theta sine theta, so I've got to put a half through, put a minus sign to get these two to flip around. And now it's starting to look, ooh, kind of, sort of, very similar in its form. And this, now that's just cos 2 theta again, so that's, tor xy times cos 2 theta. And then, so there's a real symmetry in those two, except this one has an additional half. So now we're ready to look at equation, uh, to look at figure 9 in the notes, uh, which we'll just walk through now. So figure 9 in the notes shows um, how the normal and shear stresses, sigma and tor, vary with angle. And notice that I've only plotted the, the diagram here. You can only do it for angles up to 90 degrees for our little inclined plane. But then if you did it for a bigger angle, just imagine you keep rotating the stress tensor, you can go all the way up to 180 degrees. And then it would repeat, because you're in double angles here, two thetas, it would repeat for 180 to 360. And what you see is you have a, like a sine wave, cos wave, with a period of pi, because it's 2 theta, so its period now isn't 2 pi, as it would normally be if it's just cos theta. Cos 2 theta has a period of pi. The average of the two normal stresses, sigma x and sigma y, is where the middle of that uh, cos sine wave is for sigma. And uh, it goes has a minima and a maxima, which we can find. Um, similarly, the Tor equation... Uh, oscillates about zero because it just has a sine and a cosine. There's no average component. It has a period of pi and it has minimum maxima. And on figure nine, uh, the minimum maxima offset by 45 degrees from the minimum maxima for sigma. And we'll see how those work in a moment. And these minimum maxima are very important. They're called the principal stresses. And finding those is going to be the subject of the next segment.